the Weinstein Company deciding to put itself up for sale and get out of the business, at least the public business of making movies. Louisville voting to terminate Rick Pitino's contract and saying they have the cause to do it. And Tesla doing what it does every single year, saying it needs more people to build more cars, yet firing hundreds in its annual review process. Those three stories did not make it into the top ten for this week. They came very close, but didn't quite crack the top ten. So what stories are the top stories that you picked all week long? We'll let you know in just a moment here for the weekly wrap up podcast from This is a Conversation. It's for the week ending October the 21st, 2017. And welcome to the podcast. My name is Jay Cooper Payne. I'm your host for this podcast and all things that come through our website and on social media presence under This Is The Conversation. The hashtag, of course, hashtag This Is The Conversation. You can find everything you need to know about us in the big grand scale at the website thisisaconversation.com. But how we operate is very simple. We operate as a fairly good social media presence and we talk to you all week long about what you like to see in the news, what stories are interesting to you because we know the news headlines on the major networks and basically all the major outlets get stuck on the same sort of issue. And right now the issue is mostly Trump stuff. And if you want to get out of Trump stuff, we put out stories to some of the fringer stuff, some of the cuter stuff, some of the more interesting stuff, and some things so far off the beaten path that we are sometimes surprised you're actually into it. We put them out there via our social media feeds on Twitter, TH underscore conversation, and on Facebook, this is a conversation.com. Make sure you set your views to the fault so that we pop up into your feeds automatically. And then as they come through, we just ask you to do what you do with stories you like. Share them, like them, talk about them, comment on them, hate them if you want to. But we're looking for the best interaction. And the stories with the most interaction, as we put them all together and add them up, uh, become the big list for the week. A shorter list for this week. We didn't have as many stories in the listing this week, but the stories we did have uh, were pretty impactful. In fact, we did some magic math to make some things work out in some cases. We'll talk about that in just a moment when we get into the stories. But that's it. To be a part of the process, you just follow us on social media or follow us at our website, thisisaconversation.com, and let us know what you think about the stories as they come down by just simply interacting with those stories. This week, we have an interview with Juice Kelly, the host of the podcast Juice in the Morning. A very interesting, very cool podcast, and I think you'd enjoy him and what he has to talk about, and we will, of course, see how he deals with this week's top 10 stories. And, of course, after that, we'll talk about some of the stories and going deeper into the stories that we talked about in the tease and some other stories that didn't make it into the top 10 list for this week. This week was a shorter listed week of stories. We've been averaging over 70 stories, some weeks over almost 80, 90 stories a week. This week, we're only at 50 the eight specific stories dedicated to here we had the, we crunched a couple together you'll we'll find out in the top 10 it was go th- through those stories but so we're going to go ahead and get into the top 10 stories right now for this week and we'll let it all play out as it does and of course this is all voted on by you with your interaction inside of social media from 10 to 1 starting off with the number 10 story where an indian lawmaker as in india decides to uh, go on a rant on the traditions and the actual people of India and goes on a large rant on the Taj Mahal, which is a grand palace and, of course, a very grand tourist attraction, but says the Taj Mahal itself has no place in its country's actual historic uh, talkings. Now, this... uh, this politician essentially is doing his best to uh, garner his base, if you will. We see this all the time here in the States, but this sort of proves that our podcasts, our conversations are international. They grow beyond just the borders here in the States because with this this week's particularly, we have a lot of stories that have an international base. But this story popped up as one of the larger stories of the week, number 10 to be exact, uh, for one lawmaker doing something that we're used to seeing around here sort of rewriting history in their own image for their own speak and they say the Taj Mahal which many of us here on this side of the world see as a pretty much a symbol of India has no right to be a symbol of India itself 
The number nine story, which has a jump in response rate of 5.77 percent, is a Mississippi school district is pulling to kill a mockingbird. Now, this is something that's not necessarily a new thing. We have this month, I believe, is Banned Books Month, and we have a Banned Books Week where libraries around the nation celebrate books that have been banned from essentially school districts or normal culture for some sort of reason. Most of those reasons are uh, the speak in them are are not exactly up with the times. As an example, many of the Mark Twain books, which have a lot of slang, which is uh, offensive to many people, uh, but was to speak of the time, and it goes to the colloquialism of the actual stories, are banned by many places, uh, public libraries, school libraries, because of the speech. Um, the Killer Mockingbird was uh, banned specifically because it made people feel uncomfortable because of the situation. If you're not um, familiar with the actual plot of The Kill a Mockingbird, you can probably go see the great movie uh, starring Gregory Peck, where a lawyer named Atticus Finch goes on to represent a black man accused of assaulting a white woman. And the whole thing is totally made up, and it's made up from the start, and the whole thing is a setup. It's as you go through the trial, you go to see that the the white the white woman was being mistreated by her family and the black man. And this is um, Jim Crow South, not quite slavery time, but a bit past that. The black man feels sorry for the young lady, and that was his actual crime. He, as a black man and a lesser citizen in the times, felt sorry for a white woman, and that's what basically got him convicted. He loses the trial, and it's a very sad thing. And the entire town, including all the black people in town, are up in the, up in the uh, balcony watching, and the white people are on the floor. And it's an amazing story, amazing book. And if you don't understand that this is an actual representation of our culture and our times or a time here in the United States, you have to really get into that. But because the book makes people feel uncomfortable, it's been banned by a school district in Mississippi. You can see how that works out. Number eight story of the week. This one has a, a rise of 1.8% in response time, and that is the death of Gord Dowie. Now, he is the uh, lead singer for Tragedy Hip, the Canadian and basically a Canadian um, treasure for all practical purposes, died at the age of 53 this week. Going up to the number seven story, this one gets a slightly larger bump, 3.5%. In response, Donald Trump drops 92 places in the Forbes Richest Americans list. Now, I don't actually have the list in front of me, but Forbes does lists of things, and it's been doing it for years as a way to uh, promote what it does and sell special issues of papers. Donald Trump, over the past year or so-ish that he's been the president and is no longer in charge of his companies, although they still run, and no longer has day-to-day operations of his company, although he probably actually does, uh, has lost a little bit of juice by them being run by whomever whether uh, the people he's entrusted into or specifically his sons, uh, who are mainly the heads of the family, heads of the household for the company right now. His spot in the Forbes top richest Americans dropped by 92 places, which says a lot and doesn't really say that much because everyone in that list are essentially billionaires or very, very high multimillionaires. He's still pretty rich. He just isn't as rich on paper due to a lot of things here. And a lot of these things are due to the fact that he's not actively making any money as a business person. Remember, all his dealings aren't quite in a blind trust, but they're in a trust run by his sons and other people, so he doesn't have day-to-day operations hands-on to his money. Number six story for this week. This one gets a jump about five point, or exactly 5.17% uh, in response Dozens of ISIS fighters reportedly surrender in Raqqa. This goes on to the larger story where Raqqa in Syria has been liberated from the ISIS uh, terror there. And a lot of stories coming from that, including side-by-side video clips of the ISIS forces driving their tanks around a, a, a stadium there. And the rebels who just released ISIS or released ISIS of their duties of holding Raqqa doing the same sort of wheelies in their tanks there. Now, the place is destroyed. Make no no. No bones about it. Uh, after being taken by ISIS, destroyed by ISIS, and then still uh, left bare, essentially, there's very little infrastructure left. Buildings basically knocked down. The only things that are essentially of any any use are a hospital, which they kept intact because that's where they held a lot of human shields, and a stadium because it was so large and massive 
it's hard to really to destroy the whole thing. But then the underlying infrastructure, as you know, for stadiums, usually are underground or inside the workings. But the inside of the of the of that stadium turned into essentially a large prison, and that hospital, as we said, mostly used for housing human shields. But Raqqa, officially released by ISIS, officially um, taken over by the rebels, there they're there. The biggest issue is how will they rebuild? They're asking people who live there not to come back because there's really nothing to come back to. And whether the actual Syrian government or maybe some local tribes who are still empathetic, sympathetic, believing in the ISIS cause may sneak back in and take over this city and you know do with it as they want to. Going to the number five story for this week. This one gets a jump of about 8.2% from the number six. New study shows TV networks exploited Las Vegas shooting to further gun control agenda. Now, this is something that you probably won't dismiss as easily as people probably thought they're going to with this. Now, we know that the media itself, at least the mainstream media, is a bit liberal. And it always has been a bit liberal uh, because they feel and they have the right to report on what happens, which is what they should do. The flip side of that is they also have to make a living and make money, so they have to be profitable enough to have people to do their reporting. As the business of media becomes harder and harder to work at, trust me, I work at it every single day, the dollars aren't as readily available as they are, so sometimes the resources aren't there as they need to be. What you do in those situations is you do a lot of pieces that tug on heartstrings and bring people in who are going to jump onto a cause and you know feel more for the story, and that's a way to gather more eyeballs in general so you can gain more what's going on. So the line about never letting a tragedy go to waste is something that is used on both sides of the war because the, you, you get a chance to stir up some emotions and get something out of that. Well, I'm not saying the media jumped on this as a tragedy or really needed another reason to push on gun control. Many in the media did seize the opportunity to take upon themselves to put shed lights on various issues. The gun control issue has not been a big one lately. And, of course, the biggest thing that came out of the Las Vegas shooting is the bump stock, uh, the existence of it, number one, and the sort of universal want to get rid of it or to allow less of it. In fact, the NRA jumped pretty quickly on not saying the, the bump stock was a grand thing for their agenda. They still want people to have the rights to have weapons, and they still want people to have the rights to have automatic weapons if they can purchase them and keep up with them. But things like a bump stock and things like these things that sort of cheat the system to get around things aren't necessarily a great thing. Of course, sales of bump stocks went up about a thousand percent after people found out they existed. And those things happen. Another way a tragedy isn't wasted on the bottom line of people who make money from it. But this study particularly pointed out that the TV networks did use the Las Vegas shooting to further a gun control agenda specifically on purpose they knew what they had and they wrote their stories to follow along not so much the facts not saying they left out the facts but to focus on why the gun the gun lobby essentially has issues with the rest of the world and their their thinking they got that from the tragedy there now the number four story gets a jump a 24.24 percent from the number five story in responses and this one's kind of a silly one but it's not. Here's what it is. Scaramucci posts Yank's Twitter poll on Holocaust death toll. What's funny about it? Anthony Scaramucci, the former deputy or former head of communications for the White House for about a week, uh, who essentially got fired for being more Trump than Trump, uh, is essentially gone and went on a speaking tour after he gave up some business dealings to go work for the government. And now he's sort of making it up money wise and fame wise to use the, to use a little bit of extra fame on this. He has something called a Scaramucci Post, which is an actual, which is not an actual publication of anything other than just a Twitter feed. And there's various people that manage a Twitter feed for Mr. Scaramucci because when you have that kind of power and juice and money, you don't run your own Twitter feed. Someone else does it unless you're President Trump. The Scaramucci Post put out a poll sometime this week that asked how many people died in the Holocaust and gave different range numbers for who died in the Holocaust. Here's where things got really crazy. Number one, it was kind of a uh, a lax post, a post that did not go out with enough thinking. 
Number two, we found out that Scaramucci's not actually running his Twitter feed. No surprise. He was in Europe on a speaking tour, and someone else who worked for Scaramucci actually put up the post. The explanation from this person, who profusely apologized, was to put a sort of light on the enormity of the Holocaust. So asking people how many people died in Holocaust, and they see the real answer, uh, was the actual point of the post. Although it was not so much in poor taste, but just kind of really, really, really dumb and not really explained and unnecessary because the Scaramucci post itself is unnecessary. You can put that any way you need to on that one. Going to the number three story, this one made a huge jump, a 268% from the Scaramucci Post number four story. And this is uh, one that may or may not surprise you. It also always, always tells us what people are thinking about and what people jump onto when we put out some of these things. But there was a conspiracy throughout the week at, that about uh, around the First Lady of the United States. Here's the headline we posted. Twitter convinced the White House using a Melania, Melania Trump stunt double. That is it. There were some weird things that happened this week. Um, Donald Trump, at a press conference, at a, at a speaking engagement or something like that, uh, because he speaks off the cuff and speaks so rambly and kind of top-of-mind stuff, most of his speeches aren't very eloquent when he literally has nothing to read off of. So he made a statement about my wife, Melania, who's right here with me, when she was standing literally um, right there behind him, was in the shot there. Uh, there's no reason to think Melania was not right there with him because she was literally in scene with him. Because of that line, some people took it upon themselves to do a study of some facial recognition, and they did a look at basically um, the fact that she's always um, she's always wearing these big, huge, dark sunglasses. So they did some facial recognition, did some looking, and thought that, well, maybe... They're using body doubles, people who look a lot like her uh, and have the same body type, and she's being sent around with the president for whatever reason. Maybe the president doesn't really do well with her around. Maybe the president isn't happy with her since uh, you know, the whole trip to the Vatican where she, she pushed his hand aside, and you know, so she's in timeout. We don't really know. Uh, we also don't know why she wears high heels on trips to disaster areas, but that's a whole other issue itself. Twitter believes there might be a conspiracy that Melania Trump isn't the Melania Trump that um, we think she is, or at least she isn't there with him in these public appearances. You can believe what you want to believe because that's just how it went. The next story, the number two story, had another big jump, 163.5% jump in reaction to it. And this one is one that we actually did a little manipulation with because we actually combined two pretty big headlines that both jumped in the top ten, so we put them together to make it a larger story. One of these headlines already ranked up at number two already, but we added the second one, so it became a super number two. It was not enough to mark out the super number one. We'll explain that in a second. Uh, but this is about the shootings, two shootings in less than a week on a Virginia State University campus. The school was on lockdown until early this morning from a second shooting uh, that happened. The shooting last Saturday occurred as well. There's no connection to the shootings, but it's just the fact that there were two of these things happening in such a close period of time, less than a week, about six days, if my math is right. The second shooting, of course, happened about uh, 2 a.m. on Thursday night. A person was shot behind a student building in the stomach. Uh, 200 people were dispersed at the area, and, of course, schools on lockdown uh, up until the early hours of this morning, this Friday morning, as we tape this. Also happening last Saturday during homecoming weekend, there was a shooting on campus. It was not a student. And the person was hospitalized with non-life-threatening wounds, so that was taken care of. The school's in lockdown uh, for, uh, for about four hours on that issue. No one's been found for that event. I don't think anyone's been found for the issue from this morning. Uh, we will, of course, stick with this one. This one will probably stick with us again because the second shooting was so high up in numbers so quickly that it will probably be a replay maybe in the top ten again next week when we get to talking about stories. Now, this upcoming story will probably not be a top 10 again, but it was a super story for it this week. And it, it goes to show the fact that these natural disasters, these uh, acts of God, if you will, are global things. We had 
four or five of them hurricanes hit here in the general area of the United States within a span of a month. And we took a lot of time to talk about them. We're talking right now a lot about the relief that is being done and in some places not being done in some spots. Another hurricane, and this is something that for us Americans to realize that these things happen other places. Big time hurricane named Ophelia hitting over in the UK and a big chunk of Europe. We had three posts on Ophelia for the week. The number one post was so high up, we decided to go ahead and add the three together to make a super number one. And from that, the jump from two to one is a 30% jump in response. It was that big. They were all that big, even with the double up for number two. The triple up number three still made it that large. And Hurricane Ophelia went through Ireland, went through Scotland, went through a bunch of the U.K., and actually caused some issues in some various other places. Uh, Killed three people officially from the storm, but there are also issues with um, fires in Portugal, and some uh, Norway could see some of the smoke from the fires uh, in in Portugal. It was... um, amazing what these things do we are talking a lot here in the states about the uh, about puerto rico and the u.s virgin islands the fact that they've just got devastated by essentially two hurricanes the biggest one maria which went directly over them and the aid that isn't getting to them because of whatever reason it's not but there's also issues in other places owned by other people if you will uh, where they have to deal with them as well. It wasn't such a big hurricane, about a Category 1, when it actually hit land in most places. It didn't get garnered up past, too close past 1 in all of its wreckage. But the fact that we could see uh, tweets from across the pond from over here of things being shut down early and people being preparing for it, and uh, we got some responses, and I did some chatter over the Internet with some people overseas over there as they were preparing for it uh, and and knowing that it was a very serious thing. Only three people listed dead from the reporting we're seeing from here from the actual hurricane, uh, but Orphelia did do some damage in some places and it, these things, hurricanes aren't not just us, for us here in the states or in the side of the, of the hemisphere. They happen all over the world, even with different names. It's not, you know, we call this one a typhoon, we call this one a whatever. This was a hurricane officially, and it went through a pretty majorly populated area of people. So we're glad that it's over there. We're glad the loss of life was small, but we also mourn the loss of life from Hurricane Ophelia battering areas of Europe, especially Ireland, Scotland, and, well, the U.K. and London itself. That is our top 10 for the week. Uh, The jump from 10 to 1, uh, the responses from the Indian lawmaker that's complaining about the Taj Mahal and to Hurricane Ophelia, which weird because they're both international, was about about 2,000%, 1,892% higher, mostly because we did do the math to add the massive Ophelia coverage. But it was just that much response to what was going on for the week. We're glad that you were a part of this response. You can be a part of the response for the upcoming weeks, beyond, 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 very simply by following us on social media. Go to your Twitter and look for TH underscore conversation. Go to your Facebook and search for This is the Conversation. And make sure that for Facebook, you set it up so that we are in your feed by default. That way you can see them come up. Or just stop by our website every so often, This is thisistheconversation.com. Stop by there. Stop by the social media. You will see the stories pop out day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And as you see one that you like, love, hate, or just can't really get into, but it draws you in anyway, respond to it, like it, love it, share it. Give a reply, tell us what you think, and we'll let more people know what you think about it every single week as we do our weekly wrap-up podcast. On the way, Juice Kelly, and he's going to play the brackets, and we'll get a chance to talk about his podcast, Juice in the Morning, from the weekly wrap-up podcast. That's what we do here from thisisaconversation.com. The Conversation Survey Panel does something that many companies out there do. They ask you questions and they pay you. What we do that's not like what many companies do, when we ask you questions, we expect to pay you. We're not looking to disqualify you from the get-go. We're not looking for a large swath of people to disqualify from the survey and then just cherry-pick a couple folks who are the same ones doing the same things. We put you in the survey system. We put you in the data bank. We put you in a case, if you will, a box, if you will, 
And when we open that box and we toss out a survey to everyone in that box, everyone in that box is going to get paid for doing the survey. As a longtime online survey participant, I got really frustrated when they started tying the hands of people doing surveys as it consolidated the actual survey groups. So there's only a handful of groups that still do that under very small different names to make it sound different. And so they're essentially going through the same listings of people to do the same surveys. So we're an independent agency. We do these things for people who want your information. They could be retailers. They could be politicians. They could be municipalities. It could just be sometimes just agencies looking for info on stuff and we get your information which is very simple you fill out a form say what tells your interests are every so often we'll send other surveys out there that don't pay but they will do things to helpfully get more demographic stuff to pull in who's going to be good for a fit and when we send you a survey and send you a dollar amount and say please do the survey we will pay you upon completion of the actual survey time and your PayPal account. So it's that simple. If we send you a $1 survey and you fill it out, by the time the survey closes and we get all the tabulations in, we will pay you $1 via PayPal. Just like that. To get into this, I think, pretty great thing, it's very simple. Just go to thisisaconversation.com slash survey panel. Thisisaconversation.com slash survey panel. Fill it out. Let us know what you think. And hopefully, we'll get you a survey pretty quickly that will get you paid juice kelly is the host of a podcast called juice in the morning of all things and he and his co-host do a great job of getting together and having what's I can describe as a professional-sounding podcast. Now, many podcasters, myself included, sometimes get on a rambly kind of thing where they're just kind of just yakking into a microphone, but they have a design of sound that even though it's a podcast and you can listen to it any time of day, it sounds a lot like what you listen to for your morning zoo-type radio show. And I just opened the interview with asking the question, how did you come up with your design for your sound? The main reason that I kind of started being interested in radio and and all that stuff was the the bob and tom show here in indianapolis um they are syndicated and are nationally known but listening to them made me laugh i enjoyed it and then kind of like a few years later i was in college and a buddy of mine was listening to the joe rogan podcast he was actually watching it on youtube and i was like what's this and i sat down and, and watched it and i've talked about this on my podcast before we watched probably like three or four episodes and if you guys know the Joe Rogan podcast, they're about an hour and a half to two hours long. So, like, I probably sat and got, like, went through about eight hours worth of podcast in about one sitting and just decided, like, at that moment, I was like, I want to do this. This is something I want to do. And then um, fast forward a few years because I procrastinated and didn't actually do what I said I was going to do. And then, you know, my mom bought me a uh, podcaster kit from Amazon, and it's like a Behringer. It's a cheap little board and a microphone. So then I didn't have any excuses left. I just had to I had to go out and do it and actually figure out how I was going to do it. And then kind of around that same time, I had gotten into the, the Adam Carolla podcast. And his literally sounds like a radio show. They have segments. They have, they have music. They have things like that that kind of like inspired me. And it allows me to kind of chase my dream because my dream was when I finished college, I was going to move to California and be on TV or be on the radio or be behind the scenes. I was literally just going to move and do that. And then life kind of got in the way. I met my wife, got a job that was a, a pretty good job that allowed me to um, live to a certain level. And I just wanted to continue to chase that dream still, even though I wasn't in the area that I thought I was going to going to be. So basically, I, I modeled the, the show off of kind of what I've already listened to and what I already enjoy. But I want to kind of do a little bit different, you know, aspect by throwing my voice into the ring. And I think that I've got an interesting take on things. There's a lot of, I do get into my own head a lot and think really deeply on subjects. So I feel like my opinion is valid. And once again, it goes back to the little bit of narcissistic thing. I want to be famous. I want people to love me. And I want to be the first thing that uh, people think about when they wake up on Monday morning and download the podcast. Now, I found about about you by um, following the Potter and Family hashtag, and like you, I was using it to get myself famous, found a few podcasts I like and listen to them. How do you go about promoting yourself and setting yourself from the crowd? Because there's 
literally millions of people in front of microphones doing something similar. How do you make what you do and what you guys are doing sound different? So originally what I thought was, like, I want to get as big as I can nationally. I want everybody to know who I am. I want to, I want people across the world to know who I am. But then after working with a few people around my area and in the Indianapolis area, Indianapolis, Indiana, my co-host that I've had, Shane just started, but he's been on for a few episodes. He's awesome, and then Hannah has been on, off and on for quite a while. But we decided we wanted to go in a direction more locally. So basically, what we wanted to do was start trying to promote in the, our area. So going to places and being like, "Hey, you know, we want to we want to promote your business on our show. I can show you kind of our downloads. I can show you what our demographic is, what we do, and then grow from there locally." Because I want, I've also made quite a few friends from the uh, Potter and Family hashtag. I really appreciate everybody that shares and likes things and then contacts us to be a part of their show. And I think I've I've already started doing some, like, I, I consider myself the Midwest ambassador because I've worked with some people from the uh, Philadelphia area, New Jersey area, the Vancouver, Washington area, or Vancouver, Seattle. I'm, I'm messed up. I'm bad at geography. <laughs> I'm sorry. But um, basically... I decided that I wanted to kind of try to get our, our uh, Midwest uh, feel out there because we do have some interesting interesting takes on some things, and it's a lot different here in the Midwest than it is even in the East and in the far out West because we just have a different way of looking at things. I just interviewed a guy on my podcast recently from California, and he was talking about having a therapist and you know growing up in the Midwest and in my in my area. You know, therapy was not the kind of thing you did. You kind of deal with your own problems. You internalize things until, you know, one day you just blow up and freak out on somebody. So um, it's, it's kind of an interesting, interesting area, and I think it's got a lot to offer. And I've also decided that I wanted to start doing a local beer review that I do on YouTube to also be like that. I said the Midwest ambassador for, for the uh, Bumming with Bobcat podcast so that I can try to get the um, the Midwest uh, beer scene is very very popular right now so I want to try to take advantage of those um, people that are interested in that and then also the people that are interested in beer because then I can hopefully do like a crossover and get those people that are interested in the beer interested in the podcast as well well before we get into the brackets go ahead and promote where we can find information for the main podcast and the beer podcast if you will yeah, the, the beer the beer reviews on YouTube. It's just going to be Juice in the Morning weekly beer review. Um, if you search for Juice in the Morning um, on YouTube, my channel will pop up. And then the Juice in the uh, Morning podcast is on anywhere you get podcasts. If you search Juice in the Morning, you'll find it. It's most popular with Apple Podcasts. And then basically anywhere else that they look, they'll find it. To follow on Twitter, it's at Juice in the AM just wanted to shorten it up a little bit so it was a little easier to find and then on instagram also at juice in the am i'm always posting stuff from the show and all that stuff and to make things fairly clear because my wife was a bit concerned you're not that juice you're a totally different juice <laughs> absolutely yeah i uh I've, I've actually it's funny the, the people recognizing the uh, juice name is has grown quite a bit since uh juice got released from prison again <laughs> So hopefully you're getting some good um, vibe from that. My wife was a bit concerned when she saw my calendar and saw I had to call the juice on um, Friday. <laughs> so uh, I had to make sure, no, no, uh, not that juice. You guys, will be, you guys will be definitely safe, I promise. All right, so we're going to put the brackets. I'm going to go ahead and re-explain it for the people listening in. This is a game that works a lot like your March Madness brackets, uh, where we have the top ten stories for the week that we've weighted in an unfair order so they're totally random from the top 10 list and you have no idea what our top 10 is at this point correct absolutely i i, I have no clue all right I'm excited so, though. so we've got the top we got the top 10 stories uh ranked in a different order out of order and we're going to present them to juice tw- two at a time and then he gets a chance to pick one story to move on to the next round or if he doesn't like either of those stories or there's something he doesn't want to deal with, he can pass on that and move on to the next round. Now, when we come to the end, he'll pick a one final story, and that'll be his top story of the week, and we'll give him a couple minutes to kind of talk about how he feels about that story. And you do pick a lot of news and current events, so I'm sure you're up to many stories. Some of these maybe we went really international this week, so that's that just sort of happened. All right, okay. so you ready to go? 
Yeah, I'm ready. All right. And remember, you can pass on a group, and you may want to pass off off the bat. The number one and number two stories popped up in the first grouping, and they are dealing with Hurricane Ophelia. That's the hurricane that hit over in Ireland and the U.K., and the shootings, two shootings at the Virginia State University campus, one early this morning or late last night and one last Saturday. You can pick one of those two stories to move forward, or we can go ahead and pass this group. I would say, honestly, I would like to move forward the uh, the, Ira, the the hurricane in Ireland. Okay, awesome, not a problem. Is that one or two? That's that's one, but that that's number one. Yeah, number one. That was the top story this week, and we and we had a couple that kind of made it a monster, uh, no pun intended, story. So we'll move that one <laughs> along, and we'll see if that one survives the brackets. The next two groupings are our number nine story of the week, which was the Mississippi school district that is pulling to kill a mockingbird. The book off its reading list because it, quote, makes people uncomfortable. And another headline was number, Jesus. <laughs> number five. The number five headline was new study shows TV networks exploited Las Vegas shooting to further gun control agenda. Which one of those are more interesting? Would you like to move forward? Man, those are both good. Um, since since I already talked about the Vegas thing on my own podcast, I actually would like to kind of give my opinion on the um, – the, the book being removed, so I'd like to move the book forward. Okay, so next up grouping we have are an Indian, as in India, the country, a lawmaker in India says Taj Mahal has no place in this country's history, or the number three story this week, Twitter convinced the White House is using a Melania Trump stunt double. Double. Devil. Double. <laughs> <laughs> I want the Melania Trump yeah. to move forward. That's a no-brainer. That right was there. a bit of a Freudian swip, slip there. The double, not devil. Um, okay, <laughs> and okay. so there's two more groups left. You can skip on this one or go to the next. And the number four one is Scaramucci Post yanks Twitter poll on the Holocaust death toll, and Donald Trump drops 92 places in Forbes' richest list. The number four story, number seven story. You want to take one of these? You want to pass to the next batch? I think. I think we'll. I think we can pass on that. I mean, with the the 92 spots, I think we saw that coming because the pre- being the president of the United States doesn't pay as well as uh, being a uh, a uh, corrupt businessman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to skip those two. We're gonna, you got to pick between these next two. Uh, number six story is dozens of ISIS fighters reportedly surrender at Raqqa, surrendering the city. Or tragically hip Gordy Gord Downey. I always mess that up. Gord Downey dead at fifty three. So that's number six and number eight. You want to go with ISIS or you want to go with uh, Gord Downey? Let's do ISIS because unfortunately I'm not one hundred percent sure who the who that person is. <laughs> he is the lead singer of Tragically Hip. He is Canadian um, and he's kind of a he's niches, but he's something. Listened to him a lot back when I was in college, so that's kind of one of yeah. those things. All right, so now we're going to place off Hurricane Ophelia, the number one story versus the number nine story, the Mississippi School District pulling the kill a mockingbird. Which one would you like to move forward? Let's uh, do the kill a mockingbird. All right. And between uh, the number three story, Millennia Trump stunt double, maybe, or ISIS uh, leaving Raqqa or being pushed out of Raqqa? That's, that's Melania. All right. So that means you are choosing between uh, the school district in Mississippi who is pulling to kill a mockingbird off its reading list, or is Melania Trump actually a stunt double uh, for the White House is controlling for whatever means? Which one of these stories are you picking as your top story of the week and you like to speak on? I think the Melania one. I just think it's hilarious. Well, there you go. You, you have chosen that Melania Trump. Uh, so let me give you a quick <laughs> background on what the story is. President Trump was speaking somewhere in the last couple of weeks, and he made the statement with Melania standing behind him uh, and my wife Melania, who is here with me right here behind me, and kind of continued on as he sort of rambles in his speeches. And so, yeah. in, so taking that a little too literally, as Twitter does, that someone started taking some facial recognition software and kind of looked at the, their faces. Notice she's always wearing these large glasses around her eyes, and she has yeah. a similar kind of uniform when she does these things. So maybe they have some Melania stunt doubles that go out with Donald Trump for these things because maybe they're not so happy uh, together. So there's a theory yeah, well, that, well, that that's 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 going on. And Twitter, of course, blew up with that. Yeah, go ahead. The, the first thing that I saw was the. There is a. I actually saw something regarding this story. There was um, somebody that took the photo and compared it to like Melania's um, normal photo and showed that like there was somebody with a bigger nose or something like that or a fake nose. 
So it's definitely like somebody going down the rabbit hole of conspiracies, like I love to do. And uh, it's one of those things that, like, it's like, you know, I think that it's crazy that, A, people are looking for that. B, it's quite, it's very plausible that she could definitely not want to be at any uh, at any of the engagements and she may not even be that happy to be married and then see the fact that it's almost the, like her when you said uniform it immediately made me think of you know djs that are like marshmallow or dead mouse or those guys where they're literally wearing a helmet so you could essentially be in multiple places at once and do multiple engagements and people wouldn't even know it because they aren't actually looking at the person so I think that that's that I think it's very plausible. I think it's very easily uh, easily done by them to do that to have somebody with the glasses and and um, the large glasses covering the face and like the even a wig or something you could definitely pull it off. Now, what does it say about us as hum- humans that we're really really getting into something like maybe there's a fake White House or maybe the White House has a fake First Lady traveling with the President because the real First Lady won't travel with him. I think it. I think it goes to what you know. We've all talked about with conspiracies is, is the fact that we don't we don't know, and we want the answers, and we never really ever seem to get the answers. And a point that I've wanted to make with conspiracies and wanted to talk about even on my own show is is if if all of these things were confirmed or denied, our appetite to have these things confirmed and denied and or denied would become insatiable. We'd all, all, that's all that we would focus on is like, you know, can you confirm that this person is that? And if they do or, de- or they deny it or whatever, then we just move on to the next thing and we would just, it would just keep growing. So I feel like honestly, the government is trying to do what, not just the government, but anybody involved in conspiracies is trying to do what I think the best in their mind option is, which is just leave it up in the air. If, if people don't know for sure, then we're never going to have to actually answer for anything. We're not actually going to have to do anything about it, and we'll just let it go. And then the fact that we are either we're willing we're not willing to accept that somebody is married to the guy that is one of the most hated people in America right now. I think that says a lot about our our country as well. So the fact that Donald Trump is not tweeting about this is a reason for us to really dig deeper into this conspiracy theory. Absolutely, because, you know, that guy is a tweet machine. As soon as he sees something, he denies or argues about it, even if it's something as ridiculous as, you know, the the um, fake news. Like, I mean, anytime anybody posts something and he disagrees with it, he argues with it. So I wonder if that, that is feeding into that, that little bit of a conspiracy of, like, is this really her? Because he's pretty silent about it. I haven't heard anything besides just those, little quick news article saying that it's you know it may not be her well we will see whether it is her or it's not her i guess eventually down the line but we of course will hear you on the internet so tell us once again how we can hook up with juice in the morning on the internet you can once again find it on anywhere you get your podcast just search juice in the morning and uh, it's a black and orange background so if you found that it's uh, it's correct and then also if you if you hear my voice because everybody tells me i have a good uh, deep deep sexy voice so as soon as you hear that you'll know and then also you can find it on twitter at juice in the am and then also on instagram at juice in the am Special thanks to Juice Kelly for joining us on the podcast today. Check out his podcast called Juice in the Morning. We are very much out of time, so we're going to remind you how to be a part of all the conversations seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We're sending out tweets all the time. Follow us on Twitter at TH underscore conversation. On Facebook, look for This is a Conversation, or follow our main website, thisisaconversation.com. As we say, share with some friends, share with some enemies, share it with a few random strangers so we have great people having great conversations together. So let's get into the top, rounding out the top 15 as we run out of time very quickly. The number 11 story for this week was the Weinstein Company saying it was in talks to sell itself after all the dealings with the Harvey Weinstein incident, and they're growing by leaps and bounds every day. Louisville, the university, voted to terminate Rick Pitino, the basketball coach's contract. They say with cause, essentially being a scumbag is enough cause for that. 
Tesla fires hundreds of workers as part of their annual review process, even though they are saying they need more workers in upcoming days or years to build more electric cars. They randomly or routinely, I should say, fire people in the review process and then rehire people based on there. If you're not in the top level percentage, you are prone to be fired from Tesla. That's how it works out. The number 14 story goes to Trump and his drug czar nominee, Tom Marino, dropping out after the Washington Post posted a expose about him essentially passing laws in Congress to make it easier for drug companies to hand out different opioids so it's harder for them to stop them from doing it. Very complicated, but essentially he's part of the problem of the opioid process and Trump was going to make him part of the process to fix it, which he probably would not have. And a number 15 story for this week, this is a great one. Chris Long of the NFL's Philadelphia Eagles has donated his first six checks for the season to charity. There are 16 games, 16 weeks in the football season. He already pledged 10 weeks out, the next 10 weeks, all cash, all money going to different charities. He's essentially working for free for the 2017-2018 season. Congratulations for just being an awesome guy, Chris Long, and doing something that most people wouldn't do, putting their money literally where their mouth is in how they want to do and be a better person. Thank you so much for being a part of the podcast and everything we have going on here. We are out of time. Join us next week for more great conversations and the top 10 conversations from thisconversation.com. 